Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Just wanted to show off another uh, recent decommission from work. Uh, sorry if the audio sucks. This is not a very good environment for doing this in, but it's where this thing ends up getting stored, so I've got to roll with it. This is both similar to and very different from the last set of servers we looked at. If you haven't checked out that video, go ahead and do it. It's where we took a look at these big beefy systems that had like four CPU sockets and a half a terabyte of RAM each. They were just very, very powerful, big systems from years ago, but they were all individual servers. This thing is really different in that it's what's called a blade center or blade chassis. Specifically, this is a Hewlett Packard C7000 series chassis. And what makes it different from those other servers is that this isn't one server. This is actually 16 separate servers. So each of these units going across here is actually its own server with its own separate CPUs and RAM and storage and network and all of that. The whole thing behind Blade servers is it's all about space, like consolidation and efficiency. These were really popular maybe 10, 15 years ago or so, but their popularity has really declined since then because of virtualization. Uh, people generally don't need a whole bunch of individual physical servers this dense anymore where they're running single applications. So there are still some uses where blades make sense. They're still sold. You can buy new modern ones, but there's a reason why this thing's been decommissioned and we'll kind of get to that as we go through it. Um, obviously this thing is huge. It's eight or 10, I don't quite remember, rack units high. And that speaks to the efficiency of it. So if you figure there are 16 servers in here and these are all populated, one separate individual server, if you were to just buy a single server from a manufacturer like Dell or HP, Lenovo, whoever, it would be one rack unit high, which is roughly the same as the width of this. If you need 16 of those, I mean, that's a lot of space. Plus there's a lot of cabling that's gonna be coming out the back of them. They're all gonna be individually managed, that sort of thing. Blade centers consolidate a lot of that in multiple ways for you, not just in terms of the physical footprint, but also in terms of the cabling and the management. Um, so on the back, you can see we've got fans. Five across the top, five across the bottom. In the middle is all of the I.O. for all of the servers, and they're spread across all these bays. They're numbered, and they serve sometimes the same purpose and sometimes different ones. Right now, most of these are gigabit networking, and these are what are called pass-through modules. You notice that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? There's 16 of these, and there's 16 blades. This is like port one for the first blade. This is port one for the second blade, that sort of thing. You can kind of see the, the legend here. These are all just one-to-one -one with each of the blades. So if you wanted all of the networking across all the blades to be plugged in, then you'd have cables going into every single one of these ports. Now, that doesn't necessarily make sense in a lot of cases. If you've got a lot of servers that are gonna be talking primarily to each other, then some of these could get swapped out with other modules that are effectively network switches. And that can save on the cabling quite a bit because the switch would not only be able to connect internally to all the networking in each of those blade servers, but then you can consolidate networks and everything coming out the ports on the back so you wouldn't need nearly as many cables. We didn't do that with this unit, um, at least not towards the end. I believe we did have a switch module for it for a while, but the usage of this thing kind of changed over time and we ended up pulling it out and putting the pass-throughs back in. So by default, every blade has two network ports assigned to it. So you'd have one port on here and one port on here for blade one, that sort of thing. And then you could get expansion cards inside the blades to activate the other ports. These are different kinds of cards. These actually aren't networking per se. This is fiber channel, and that's meant for shared storage. So if you have an external SAN storage area network type of device, uh, you can plug in fiber channel modules and fiber optic cables and then gain access to storage off of that, that unit. Because obviously with how small each of those blades are, you can only put so much internal storage in one of these. 
we'll take a look at that. We'll pull one of the blade servers itself out and kind of go through all that. So this is expansion for fiber channel. Uh, towards the bottom here, we've got power. And we've got six power supplies in this whole thing. It uses the big chunky square connectors. Um, the cabling for this thing is absolutely massive. You technically can run it on 120 volt, but generally anyone is going to be running this off of 200 to 240 volt. Uh, one other thing to show off is this in here. This particular module is for what's called lights out management. Um, HP calls it ILO, Integrated Lights Out. I've talked about this before. What's cool about this is it's got redundant ILO. So instead of just one device, you know, one module that does the remote control over this entire chassis, it's got two for failover purposes. The idea behind lights out management, ILO, DRAC, if it's, uh, you know, if it's a Dell system, that sort of thing, is it lets you remotely get access to the stats and all the hardware, power on and off the individual blades, get keyboard, mouse, and video access to each one of the blades, be able to remotely mount media like ISO image files, all that kind of stuff remotely through a web browser, which is great for troubleshooting if it's like the middle of the night and something breaks and you're at home, you can just you know get online and get into the web interface for this hardware and see what's going on without having to drive into the office. Oh, and in case ILO fails for whatever reason or you need to get on like a local keyboard mouse, like you're in the server room and you need to connect directly to say this blade because it's misbehaving or whatever, uh, that's what this adapter is for. It just plugs in to the front there and then gives you the ability to plug in monitor, keyboard mouse or other USB and then serial port uh, if you need to get a console session. Like a lot of times Linux systems will just let you connect through serial. A lot of these are either hot swap or warm swap, like the fans, they just come out. Uh, they've got an edge connector on there, as you can see. These are definitely hot swappable, meaning the system can be powered on running and you can pull them out. The modules, some of these can be hot swapped, some of them cannot, it depends on the module itself. The power supplies, of course, can as well, but the power supplies are actually around front. So let's start with these power supplies. There are six, and you may be wondering, wait a minute, how do you, how do you get access to the ones in the middle? That screen's in the way, and this screen, by the way, gives you additional information about the system. It's kind of a way to do kind of console-based access to seeing stats and error messages in particular or something's going wrong with the system. It, uh, it slides, kind of a nice feature. Um, but each of these power supplies is hot swap. Push the lever, the handle comes down, and then um, take a look at that. Um, Obviously, like I said, you, I mean, you can run this off of 100 to 120 volts if you want, but most people are going to be doing 200 to 240 volts, that we, what we were doing. Um, obviously, you get way more power output. If you just feed this thing, like, you know, regular household power, 960 watts for this power supply, if you can give it something like 208 or 240, over 2 kilowatts, 2,250 watts out of one power supply. Obviously, there's fans in it, and it you know, blows the air all the way through. Um, just for those who want to see, there's a look at the connectors on the back. This is the, D, this is the uh, excuse me, the AC input. This is what interfaces with those AC plugs on the back. And then here's the DC output, your different DC rails, plus some additional pins for sensing, like so the chassis can know if the fan has died or something like that to get the stats off the power supply. It doesn't just provide voltage, it actually provides information about its voltage so the chassis can keep an eye on it. Oh, hey, the five volt rail is starting to dip, whatever, throw an alert, send you an email, that kind of a thing. Um, I know that there's a minimum number of power supplies you need to have in this chassis in order for it to work. Um, how many is going to be dependent on how many blades you've got fired up. I know the minimum I think is two just to get the chassis going. Fully loaded all of them, all the blades, I think you can only lose one power supply. I think it needs a minimum of five if all the blades are up and running. It may also depend on the model of the blade. Um, these are all ProLiant 
focus on that. BL460Cs, the Gen 6s. Um, you can swap some other blade modules into this chassis. It is a modular system. There are, of course, limits as to how new of blades you can put into which model of chassis and, and vice versa. But you don't necessarily have to buy the entire unit in one shot. This one's, like I said, fully loaded, but there are blanks, I don't have them here with me, that you can put into some of these slots if you don't have blades for those or if you've got one taken out for maintenance. Um, you need to put the blank in instead of just leaving it as an empty gap because that helps with airflow. The blades themselves don't have fans in them. It relies on those big blowers in the back that we took a look at to pull the air from the front through the back. Okay, so here's one of the blades pulled out of the chassis. This one is fully loaded, we'll see in a second. Just like with, say, the IBM X5 or the DL580s that we looked at in that previous video, this one's got a lot of information like right on the label, and that's one of the big things you'll see with servers as opposed to like glorified desktops or workstations is there's a lot of maintenance information directly on the unit because they know people are gonna be needing to work on these and do so in a hurry. So you've got all sorts of different information, uh, the annotations about, you know, what cooling caution for, you know, making sure that you've got the, the, uh, the cover put back in, you know, if you've got this thing taken out while the chassis is up and running anyway. You push this button and the whole cover slides back. The, uh, the cover says hood release on it for this button. I kind of think that's kind of funny. Maybe it's an inside joke. This is a cover. It's not a hood, not a car, but whatever. Um, so this one, all of these blades are dual socket, meaning they've got two separate CPU sockets. Um, all of them, I believe, are Xeon E5520s. Uh, those are 2.26 gigahertz quad core eight thread CPUs. They're from Intel's Nehalem generation. They're 45 nanometer process. They are definitely not new. If memory serves, they're like second gen core I series as kind of the equivalent. Um, so that speaks to the age of this machine, but also how relatively inefficient it is, especially from a power standpoint these days. Under these covers, these are like air ducts to help make sure that the air flows through the unit correctly. You've got RAM slots. Um, this is triple channel. And obviously because we have two CPUs, they're populated um, in each. Uh, this is DDR3, I believe. Let's try and grab one out of here from somewhere where I can actually reach it. Yeah, so this is one of the lesser spec blades. I know I've got some of these here that have eight gig modules in them. These are just two gig. Uh, so a total of 12 gig of RAM in this whole system, uh, which again, for you know 10 years ago, not bad. Uh, definitely nothing now. You do see some nice touches with the way that these are built. For example, in the top of this cover, you've got this hex key. What is this hex key for? It's for removing some of the other components inside this system. So it may not necessarily be tool free in a way, but they give you the tool and the tool stays on board inside the thing. And there's one of these in every single blade. So like I was talking about with those modules in the back of the chassis for like networking and fiber channel and all that, some of the additional ports on the back are optional add-ons for these blades. This one has everything in it. So if we, uh, I believe this top card, if memory serves, is networking. Yeah, I believe this adds another six ports of networking for a potential total of eight. There are two Ethernet ports, there we go, on board. Um, you can see just a really dense connector. This is technically PCIe. And then underneath it, is this, yeah, this little bracket comes out. This is the add-on card for fiber channel. Uh, so it's got hardware accelerated, you know, access into fiber channels so you're not wasting CPU cycles on it, that sort of thing. Um, so a lot of these blades have this card in it. Some of them don't. Uh, some of them were just kind of more basic application use, so they didn't even have this add-on network card in there. But for the blades that were used for virtualization, and of course years and years ago, back when uh, we weren't doing virtualization nearly as much as we are now, um, these add-in cards made life a lot easier. It gave you access into more networks. You know, you can, you can kind of slice and dice your VMs up into a wider variety of networks 
because you've got better physical access into those for however you wanna, you wanna do that. Um, around the back of the blade, you can see this really dense connector here. So you've got both sides of it, these white parts are DC power, and you can see some of the really beefy power cables going into the motherboard from that. And then down the middle is basically the I.O. for the whole system. So uh, KVM, network, fiber channel, all of that. So like I was talking about with how these blades can be used for virtualization and how some of them don't have hard drives in them, there is kind of a neat little trick built into one of these to make it a bit easier to do that. Actually, two tricks. Um, if we pull the back plane out for the hard drives, SAS back plane, again, you can stick SATA drives in here or SAS drives. We'll take a closer look at those drives in a minute. So the back plane comes out. I've already taken the two screws out of the sides, but then this tray comes forward and lifts out. You can see what's underneath. Um, what's kind of slick is, what's this? Oh, it's a USB port. So you can stick a USB flash drive in here and use that as your boot media. So if you're running a hypervisor, something like VMware, um, where it doesn't need local disk for storage because you're gonna use iSCSI or fiber channel or something like that for external storage off of the SAN, you can just stick a flash drive in here and that makes things a lot easier. So here's a closer look at one of the hard drives that came out of this thing. Uh, this is a 72 gigabyte 15K, 15,000 RPM SAS drive, two and a half inch form factor. It you know, kind of looks a lot like a laptop hard drive and it's about that same size. It's a little bit thicker than a laptop drive, at least the modern ones, um, but it spins three times as fast. <laughs> the big thing with SAS is that it's meant for more flexibility. Um, this is a 6G. They don't label it on here. Uh, oh, excuse me, wait a minute. This is dual port 15K, so I think this is 3G, basically three gigabit, um, equivalent to SATA two speeds. We've got in some of these, these larger 600 gig drives, and you can see these are uh, 10K drives, but they call these 6G, so six gigabit, kind of equivalent to SATA three. DP means dual port. That gives you additional redundancy so you, in some systems can actually have two RAID controllers or two paths to a backplane, that sort of thing. So it just makes things more reliable. What's the likelihood of a controller failing versus an individual drive? Well, I mean, it happens. And it, you know, if you need to get as much uptime as you possibly can, you got to think at all the parts of, in the system and not just like, well, you know, the hard drive could die, let's put two of them in there. You know, controllers and cables and backplanes and all that can fail as well. Um, so you got to think about that as well. HP has, you know, got their name on all of these. It's other companies that have manufactured them. Uh, I believe this drive was manufactured by HGST, Hitachi. They're now owned by Western Digital. Uh, this drive, if memory serves based on some of these part numbers, this was made by Fujitsu. I don't think Fujitsu is in the drive business anymore, um, but that's my, my recollection based on those, those numbers. So hauling this thing in here was uh, challenging, let's just say. You can see it's on a dolly. Um, I had to take the entire thing apart in order to wheel it out of the server room and into this storage room. The blades, obviously, each server individually comes out. The power supplies come out, as we saw. All those modules in the back, the fans, they also come out. But so can this part. This is basically the kind of the back plane cage assembly. Um, that unit alone can weigh about 50 pounds. And each of these blades they're not very lightweight either. They probably weigh a good 40, 35 to 40 pounds each. So you put everything together, all the parts, the power supplies, the modules, the fans, everything, um, fully loaded this sucker weighs about 500 pounds. Yeah, this team lift thing, that's assuming the chassis is empty. And in fact, they give you this warning, empty the entire enclosure before you bother trying to lift it. 
Plus, they give you built-in handles to preside to encourage two people picking it up and hauling it. Um, the chassis alone, completely empty, is actually somewhere around 60 pounds, 70 pounds-ish. Is At least that's what it felt like to me. I was able to pick the entirely empty chassis up on my own, off the cart, you know, out of the rack and onto this dolly and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not unmanageable by yourself, but you've got to gut the entire thing in order to move it. So are these units still sold? Can you still buy blade systems? Yes, you can actually, although they're nowhere near as popular as they used to be. These really kind of had the best benefit back before virtualization became as common as it is now, or when you needed more systems that had dedicated hardware, lots of CPU, lots of RAM, that sort of thing. But their big downside was, of course, the storage situation. Uh, obviously, when you can only put two hard drives in each box, that means you have to rely on external storage, like a SAN, to get more. So it kind of limited, in some ways, the functionality for this thing. You couldn't do much that needed really, really high-speed access to data or lots of cheap capacity, because SAN systems are not cheap. These did start to do pretty well as we got into the virtualization era, kind of around the 2010s, I feel, is when that really started to take off for a lot of companies. It made a lot of sense for them to start moving into virtualization. And I mean, we did as well. You can see we've got these systems in here that don't have any hard drives in them. Um, and one thing I failed to notice, and I can actually show you how you eject one of these blades in the process, is in addition to that USB port in the top, it's also got an SD card slot there as well. So you can put, you know, install your, uh, your virtualization OS, hypervisor of choice, VMware, uh, KVM, I think is what we were running on these for a while, um, directly on something like an SD card. And then you can at least save that energy and cost of not needing to put hard drives in the front because all of the storage for your VMs is gonna be on the SAN anyway. You can still buy blade systems. There's fewer options, of course, available now, just because fewer people are buying them. But virtualization is a lot more efficient when you've got a whole bunch of VMs that do things that don't require maximum performance all the time. Because then they can all kind of balance each other out. Some are busy, some are quiet, you know, and then they flip around that sort of thing. Blades are really good at when you need maximum performance across all the systems in as small of a footprint as possible. There are caveats to something like this. Obviously the weight is one of them. Um, the power requirements, while it does save you on cabling, you only need six power cables to go in to support 16 servers and that gives you power redundancy, like power supplies can fail and they all stay up, that sort of thing. They are these big beefy cables and you need to make sure that you've got the necessary electrical infrastructure there to handle the amount of draw that this single unit is gonna wanna pull. And along those lines, there's also cooling concerns. In normal rack systems, you've got individual servers and they can be maybe spaced out from the top to the bottom. So you've got a little bit more kind of even distribution of cold air going in the front and hot air coming out the back. This guy is very like heat dense. When this thing was up and running and all the blades were going, you'd get a lot of hot air coming out the back of it. And so you had to make sure that kind of your server room or your data center was engineered properly to get the right airflow going through to be able to support something like this. But for the people who still need them, they are very useful. But unfortunately for most other people, well, blade systems are kind of a thing of the past. Anyway, if you like this one, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me, Twitter, Instagram, at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.